I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law course about a recent U.S. Supreme Court case from 2019, Azar versus Alina Health Services. And here we're talking about the informal rulemaking or notice and comment rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act and the statutory exemption or exclusion for agency statements of policy where they don't have to do that. So now for my students, just keep in mind that 553 of Section 553 of the APA requires that when agencies promulgate a rule, in, even informally, they have to publish a proposed rule and allow a period for public comment and then publish a final rule that responds to the comments. They don't have to do this under the APA, it says for general statements of policy and interpretive rules and a few other things. And so agencies um, can save a lot of time and steps if they just announce that they are interpreting either their statute or their existing regulations a certain way, um, and then they don't go through notice and comment rulemaking. But sometimes these interpretations have far-reaching consequences for the regulated industry. And let's look at what happens in this case. Okay, so the background here is um, I, going to be a little tedious, just bear with me. And this is about Medicare and Medicare programs and money for federal money that goes to hospitals. So the federal Medicare program offers um, extra money to hospitals that serve a disproportionate number of low income patients. In other words, we either reimburse or incentivize hospitals that provide um, a, a lot of medical care for people in poverty in our country. And um, we calculate whether the hospitals get this money or how much by the hospitals, um, something called their Medicare fraction. Well, what's the Medicare fraction? Um, this is the worst part of the case, bear with me. Um, the time a hospital spent caring for what are called Part A entitled patients who were also entitled to Social Security income support payments. So that's usually going to be SSI payments or maybe SSDI divided by the time the hospital spent caring for um, all the patients who are entitled to benefits under Medicare Part A. Um, to oversimplify just a little bit, this means that the percentage of all of the medic hospitals, Medicare patients who are um, on governments living in poverty and are um, in, in, eligible for and receiving um, government assistance um, for, um, uh, for those in poverty. Now, in 1997, Congress created a new Medicare program um, called Medicare Part C. And this led to the question of whether the people who enroll, patients who enroll under this new program of Part C, will be counted as part of for the Medicare fraction for that hospital. Are they entitled to benefits under Part A? And in 2004, the agency that was overseeing Medicare issued a final rule declaring that it would count Part C patients um, uh, for the fraction. Um, hospitals sued right away. Why? Because if you're expanding the denominator, um, the uh, adding all these new enrollees into the total number of those um, entitled to benefits, then you're going to have a smaller fraction as a result and get less money from the federal government. So hospitals sued and they won in court and actually got this new um, 1997 rule, uh, I'm sorry, 2004 rule from the agency um, uh, uh, vacated by the courts. Well, um, let's fast forward uh, about 10 years to 2014. And by, na by this time, we have a, um, a new president in the White House in his second term. And um, Health and Human Services, we have a new uh, secretary of HHS, Alex Azar, and they have a little problem, right? That there's this kind of gap period from when that the previous rule was vacated in 2004, and they had just promulgated a new rule in 2013 that they thought would stand up. But the question is, what do we do for um, these uh, the money for hospitals for that period in between. And in some cases, they were still sorting this out in 2014. 
And so the what the agency did was they posted on their website that the Medicare fractions um, for at least 2012 would include these Part C patients. Well, again, that's bad news for the hospitals. That's going to lower um, everybody's fraction, uh, Medicare fraction, if they have uh, Medicare Part C enrollees um, among their patients, which means that fewer of them will be eligible for those uh, federal that federal assistance. So several hospitals sued, saying that the policy should have undergone notice and comment, which it had not done. So we get to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held that the agency, Health and Human Services, should have undertaken notice and comment rulemaking. And they, this was because of the Medicare Act. Um, uh, be, before they made a substantial change, in which patients are included in the denominator of the Medicare fraction. And um, importantly for law students, and this is actually sort of an advanced administrative law point um, that will be helpful for you in practice when you're a lawyer, is that the court um, sees this as falling under the relevant statute for the Medicare Act and not an APA question. And so the Medicare Act has some of its own notice and comment provisions. And the real question before the Supreme Court was whether the APA's interpretive rule exception applied, in which case the agency doesn't have to do notice and comment rulemaking, or the Medicare Act's notice and comment provision applied, in which case they do. And the court decided that in um, Azar versus Alina Health Services, that the um, statements of policy under the APA, even though those don't require notice and comment, that the Medicare Act added some additional procedural requirements, in other words, notice and comment um, uh, requirements, for policy statements that are, quote, substantial legal standards under the Medicare Act. So note that this decision turns on a subtle point of statutory interpretation, differentiating between the phrase substantive rule as defined under the APA, which um, in, in which case public comment might have been unnecessary, and substantive legal standard under the Medicare Act, which requires notice and comment. And the court's decision turned on finding that these were not the same. And that concludes our lecture about Azahar versus Alina Health Services.